Hey everyone, we're back with a webinar series. This episode is Living and Thriving with EOE. And we're welcoming back again, Dr. Scott Gabbard and Dr. Sophia Patel of the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you both for joining us again and welcome. Thanks, Jackie. So this Thanks, is my Jackie. favorite part of this webinar series, I will admit, is living and thriving and really encouraging patients to know that they can live a normal life with a, a GI condition like EOE. And we're going to hear it straight from the health professionals, the gastroenterologist's mouth on being under GI care and achieving remission and allowing them to do the things that they love. So we're going to jump right into it with, um, you know, I'm so excited to hear examples of patient success. So let's, let's get Great. right in. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the keys that, that, you know, I tell our trainees, our, our fellows who are, who are learning from us is really, we have to individualize the care to the patient. You know, two patients are the same and everyone has sort of different expectations or, you know, a different mindset on what therapy should be. So, so number one, it should always be a discussion between the patient and the provider um, and, and care should be individualized. That said, we, we all have our success stories and and um just funny enough i was scoping one of my one of my favorite patients um yesterday uh and he's he's a gentleman who um lives in cleveland when i first met him he had been stubborn he he hadn't wanted to to get seen for swallowing disorders and during his first you know he complained of swallowing with every meal i went to scope him the very first time and his esophagus was so narrow I couldn't fit our regular scope through, which is again, about nine millimeters. Normally the esophagus should be 20 millimeters in diameter, which is a little less than an inch in diameter. And really, you know, once you get more than 17, generally patients do pretty well. My personal preference is to try to over time stretch the esophagus as large as I can. So if I can get the esophagus up to 20, I will generally do that because this is a condition where over time, the esophagus does get narrow. So the more we can open it, then the longer patients will um, you know, stay without symptoms. So he had eosinophilic esophagitis. He had both inflammation and severe narrowing. And we got his inflammation under control with some medication. And I had to sequentially stretch his esophagus. If you're starting at eight millimeters, we can't stretch you to 20. And the first go will rip a hole in your esophagus. No one wants that. So we have to go sequentially, you know, eight to 11 and then 11 to 14 every month. I, I would stretch him. And now his esophagus is 18 millimeters, again, in, in diameter. And he's traveling the world. And he's gotten to the point now where, I mean, the poor guy 10 years ago wouldn't travel anywhere. And just yesterday, I literally found out he booked a one-way ticket to Australia in May. <laughs> oh, wow. And he's planning to come home in November. So wow. that's how good he's gotten. He now, you know, he was at the point where he was getting impactions. You know, he, he would spend an hour trying to, like, vomit up the stuff that was stuck in his esophagus. Disgusting. I'm sorry for everyone listening. That was 10 years ago. Now he's... Hey, I'm going to Australia for six months. I have no problem swallowing whatsoever. His esophagus is nice and wide open. I know he's going to take his medicine. I'm very confident in, in him traveling as well. So like these are the type of success stories we can see in someone who, you know, gets his or her disease under control and then continues therapy to stay in remission where there's no more inflammation. The esophagus is nice and wide open. So what about you, Dr. Patel? What are your success stories that you like to share with our audience today? Oh, I think um, we see such a variety of different ages. I think it varies on the age. Um, I had a patient who uh, started off with us as a toddler and um, he was really very picky, didn't want to eat. And he honestly was having so many difficulties just with growing and uh, through the power of our multidisciplinary team and being able to you know, also incorporate like our OT, PT, speech and then be able to figure out that um, milk and wheat were his biggest triggers after a series still having to do a couple of scopes um, he's been thriving on a milk and wheat free diet and we're fortunate to live in this kind of time because i think there are a lot of alternatives for kids who you know when we start them on these dietary therapies so young their parents worry you know that their quality of life is going to be low because they can't eat these cookies that we know are really good 
Um, but honestly, you know, a lot of what we teach in trying to talk about is, um, you know, long-term effects of being on a medication for a long time versus finding a food that's the offending agent. And in his case, you know, we took out those foods and we were able to actually add back in a couple of things. So later on, we could add back in baked milk so you can still have a muffin or a cupcake at a friend's birthday party and not have any reactions. And um, and he's he's doing so well. It's just it's really nice to see over a period of time with him growing and gaining weight and getting taller, which is what every kid wants. So they all want to be a basketball player. So <laughs> um, but that it's just very rewarding to to really find like what's causing their issues. And just to know that, you know, we're here to help with, you know, future decisions. A milk or wheat elimination might not be the only thing that you do forever. It may be when he gets older, he decides that, hey, I want to try to have the milk. Is there something else that I can do instead? And, you know, do I have to continue doing this? And that's where, you know, coming together as a team uh, with this team approach can really help narrow down what the patient's needs are and what they would like, you know, their life to look like. So. So this is great. So there's so much, you know, positivity and hope for patients when they're getting care, when they're, you know, working with their doctor and shared decision making is a big thing. And I know I'm kind of throwing this out there, but everything that you're saying is leading me to this question. Can you explain shared decision making and why it's important, you know, to achieve this living and thriving with any GI condition, but we're talking about EOE, like, what does that look like? So I would say that in our clinic, I start off by asking them what they know about the disease. And a lot of times these patients are referred to us from other gastroenterologists who do a wonderful job explaining things to them, but they may not know like why we're asking them to do all these things or why, you know, we have to do this for a long period of time. So I try to kind of describe the background of the disease itself and then um, try to figure out what their life looks like. So like I said before, if I have a kid who is eating, you know, cereal with milk for breakfast and pizza for lunch and pizza again for dinner. I think, you know, eliminating milk from this child's diet is probably not going to be sustainable. Um, so where shared decision-making coming in comes in is where we talk to the families about what's realistic for them. What do they think they could stick with? What do you think would help in other pathways? So like maybe they have an allergic disease that's really poorly controlled or they have asthma exacerbations all the time, maybe they're a good candidate for one of these newer therapies. Um, Maybe they're type A and they're fine with taking a medication twice a day and they can do it before and after school. Great. That is not something that all my patients are compliant with. That's something that we're actually studying in our clinic to see how we can get patients to be more compliant. Um, And then, so it's, it's hard because you don't know and it should be an individualized decision. And we try to not make that decision before we meet you or decide like, oh, hey, this is a great candidate for this. Like, we're just going to tell them this is what we're going to do. But realistically, like we want them to be part of the decision because that buy in is it's really important. Yeah. And isn't it important for patients, you know, to, uh, you know, really be mindful and observant? especially with their children, like little things like they're drinking a lot of water, they're taking a long time to eat and things like that. And to be able to articulate that uh, in, or, or explain it to the, to the healthcare provider during the office visit. Absolutely. And fortunately, they don't have to do a lot of that because I do a lot of very nitpicky questions. So <laughs> don't worry. I will ask you all of that. <laughs> so, and a good gastroenterologist will get like an excellent history um, and fortunately, you know, our, our team here at Cleveland Clinic Children's, all of us are very well versed at um, doing a great job of making sure that we're asking all these questions that maybe you weren't thinking about. Who is last to eat at the dinner table? Does your child carry a bottle of water around everywhere so he can just take a sip in between everything he's eating? Um, so I think those things are definitely the more subtle things can be missed. But that's where, you know, when we talk to patients, we do ask those questions. Now, what is, what is in your eyes, you know, I know every patient's different and this is important too, because what living and thriving for one patient may be different for another. So can you explain a little bit about that and um, offer some tips for patients and for patients, uh, parents of patients, their pediatric patient on, you know, what they can do to make sure that they're living their best life with a condition like EOE? Yeah, so, you know, my goal in eosinophilic esophagitis, again, we want to individualize, you know, the, the, the therapy. So if a patient really wants 
diet therapy and not to stay on medication. I'm all for that. Um, you know, it's the, it really is all on the patient avoiding whatever foods have been identified. If a patient wants to really have the freedom to eat whatever he or she wants, then, you know, it's our job to find the medical therapy that will allow that. But I think, again, the combination of controlling the inflammation and a combination of keeping the esophagus wide open, my goal for my patients is, is to make it so they don't, shouldn't have any fear for eating any type of food, at least in terms of, you know, getting the food stuck and not to always be concerned that, you know, something could get stuck and they could end up in the emergency department. So I, I want the, you know, the patient to, to be able to eat whatever he or she would like. And I think generally, if you get the inflammation controlled, you get the esophagus stretched to above 17 or 18 millimeters, most patients should have minimal to no trouble swallowing on account of the eosinophilic esophagitis. Yeah, I think um, we have, we share the same goals. You know, we really want these kids to get better. We want their parents' life to improve without them having to worry about going on like a travel soccer trip. And, you know, what if I'm not there? We have to go to the ER. This is happening a lot. Those are the kind of things we want to alleviate those fears along with the child who may not be thinking as much about that, but we have parents who send their kids to college and they have untreated EOE and that's scary, you know, to think about sending your kid somewhere far away. You don't know what the layout is like over there and um, what we're trying to do is kind of help everybody feel better. And, um, you know, EOE is like, we think about it as the way that we treat it is we want their symptoms to get better, but we also want that inflammation to get better too. Um, because the inflammation kind of gives us a better picture of whether they're going to have any issues in the future. Um, so we'd like to have that, the healing in the tissue itself, that would be the ideal goal. That doesn't happen in every patient, but it's something that we, we try to achieve if we can. And I think the care should really be individualized. Um, so depending on what works for you as a family, what is financially something that you can do. Um, a lot of these alternative foods are much more expensive than just buying, you know, plain old cheese from the store. Um, so we want to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable for your lifestyle financially and also, you know, as a family. So I want to pick up on something that you said when, uh, a pediatric patient is transitioning to adult care, going off to college. I think this is a critical area that, you know, people need to be aware of. The parent may work really hard with the, with the child, getting them all in remission and feeling better. And then they go off to college and, you know, now they're in charge of their own health care to a certain extent. If they, if their parent, it really is not, is removed from that. Some parents, maybe they're more involved, but can you talk a bit about this and what sets a parent and that most importantly, the child who's now turning into an adult up for success as they make that transition? I think that's a great uh, point that you make there. What we do at the Cleveland Clinic, and we're one of the few places that has a clinic like this, but we do have a transition of care clinic where we have you meet with an adult gastroenterologist who's Dr. Beveridge, who you've interviewed in other podcasts. And um, about three or four times a year, we have a combined clinic with her. And if your child is close to aging out of the pediatric clinic, which for me, I usually see patients up until their, you know, their second, third year of college, you know, I always tell them if, if they get pregnant or if they have a job and they're not living with their mom and they've graduated, that's probably time to go to adult GI. Um, but fortunately, we have a transition of care clinic where they, where they meet a gastroenterologist and we talk a little bit about how her practices and um, make sure that they feel comfortable with uh, transitioning in terms of uh, what we try to do is um, we try to get them to become more of an owner of their own disease. Um, a lot of kids are brought in by their parents, their parents know everything about it, but maybe they don't know exactly everything. Um, so we try to make sure that they are aware that they have this, what their treatment is, what they've had done in the past with the dilations, because a lot of times the kids are not really answering as many of those questions. You know, the parents are there with their binders and they're like, this has happened this time. Um, <clears throat> so that part of um, kind of ownership of your disease is a big part of what we try to do in our transitional care clinic. Um, and part of that is, you know, we have uh, surveys and um, 
I'm actually planning on having more of like a, a handout for the patients that they can take a picture of on their phone or like a QR code um, and then pull it up. You know, if they have to go to the doctor and say like, hey, here, like, you know, I just want to let you know I have this and I'm on these medications just so you're aware. And just so they also feel like, you know, they're part of their own disease treatment. So that is the most important part is making sure that the patient understands that this is their disease and they should, you know, feel more independent and responsible for it at that transition point. Well, that's such great information, Dr. Patel. Thank you so much. Um, before we close out, is there anything else, any other tips, Dr. Gabbard, that you have um, that you'd like to offer as we wind down and living and thriving and encouraging patients to see their doctor and get into remission and feel better so they can travel and do whatever they they, they really want yeah. to do? Well, you know, you, you've brought up, you know, the idea of remission, right? So getting the disease under control. And what I tell patients right now is the therapies we have in 2023 are very different than the therapies we're going to have in 2033 or 2043. So whatever therapy you decide on right now doesn't mean you're going to be on that the rest of your life. This is an evolving field. And so it's really good to one you know, have regular visits with your provider, be it, you know, if, you're, if your disease is under control and it's every six months, every 12 months, that's okay. But this is an evolving field, just like we found out last year with, you know, the first FDA approval of a, of a medication, Dupilumab, there are going to be other therapies approved down the road. And so whatever you decide on, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to be on that for the rest of your life. This is an evolving field. My goal is not only, you know, keeping things under control right now, but I'm thinking about my patients 10, 20, 30 years down the road. I don't want them to have, you know, end up with a very narrow esophagus down the road 30 years from now. So I'm trying to trying to keep things under good control because we do know that there are many therapies that, that are going to come down the pipeline. And uh, boy, uh, Jackie, when you do this webinar 10 years from now, it's going to be completely different. Okay. Right? Absolutely. Totally different. <laughs> oh, 10 years from now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe we won't even have EOE 10 years from now. Who knows? I hope. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> Seriously, this has been wonderful. I hope everyone listening feels words of encouragement and inspiration to know that visiting your doctor, not being afraid to share what's going on with you can really help you get the right treatment to get your disease under control so you can really thrive and live the life that you want to lead without any obstacles or or sad moments, you really feel um, better with your um, situation. So thank you both. This has been wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Jackie. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>